All right, well, this morning we are continuing in John's Gospel, and we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 24. Oh, and I forgot, um, I'll just give you a heads up, I'd like to read through verse 26, but I do want us to uh, n- uh, realize we're only looking at verses 20 through 24. 25 and 26 is what we'll look at this evening. There's just too much here to deal with uh, in, one, in one sermon. So let's read the text, John 12, beginning in verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So in the reading of God's word, again, we're going to be looking just at uh, verses 20 through 24. Now, to get a running start of this, I just want to remind us of what we looked at last week. And we saw three things in Jesus' entry into Jerusalem uh, using, again, the, the titles or the headings I used last time. First of all, we saw the king's presentation. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Jews who had seen him raise Lazarus, as well as others who had heard their testimony, uh, came out to meet Jesus with palm branches in their hands, chanting from Psalm 118, verse 26, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the fact that they were chanting or quoting a messianic psalm and that they were greeting him with these palm branches, which as we saw were symbols of joy and victory, means that they saw Jesus as the Messiah, the promised king who was entering into Jerusalem. We saw secondly the king's purpose. Uh, They were crying out, Hosanna, which as you remember from last week means, save now, we beg you. And this comes from the same psalm, Psalm 118 in verse 25, which says, O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. That's where the Hosanna is. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. They knew that as the Messiah, Jesus had come to save them. Now they thought, remember it was from Rome's tyranny, but Jesus actually came to save them from a greater tyranny tyranny, a more dangerous one, and that is sin. That's one of the reasons why he came riding on the back of a donkey. He did that to fulfill prophecy. He did that to show his humility. But he also rode on the donkey because he was showing us he was coming to Jerusalem to offer himself up as a sacrifice, to take the curse of God's broken covenant that was meant for his people upon himself that he might die in their place, that he might free them from the power and the consequences of sin. That is what Jesus Christ has done in his crucifixion for those of us who are trusting him this morning. And then finally, we saw the different reactions to his coming. The crowds didn't understand. They thought Jesus, they thought the Messiah, this king, the son of David was going to be a political savior and he was going to save them from Rome, not a spiritual savior. They didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand. They were thinking exactly the same things as the crowds. And John tells us they didn't understand it until Jesus was glorified, until he poured his spirit out upon them. Then their eyes were opened by that anointing that teaches them all things. Then they understood Jesus' kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. Then they understood what he came to do and what their purpose was. And then finally, although we didn't note it last week, we see the Jewish leaders also didn't understand, but it was from a different perspective. They, they didn't understand why, isn't that, you know, why is it that, that we're failing to do what it is we're trying to do? We're trying to kill him. We want to get rid of him. But now, here he is riding into Jerusalem, 
being heralded as the king of Israel. They didn't understand why their efforts to stop Jesus were failing. John writes in verse 19, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. The only one who really understood was Jesus. He knew that everything that was happening at that moment was happening according to his father's plan. He was seeing it just uh, unfold before his eyes. And he knew everything was in his father's hands. Now this morning <clears throat> we get another glimpse into this plan of the father. Uh, Jesus, or actually John tells us, the Jews were not the only ones who were interested in Jesus. The ones who came out to meet him as he came into, the, into Jerusalem. But there were also some Gentiles who were interested in him as well. They wanted to see Jesus. Now here's another indication of what the Father was intending to do to glorify his Son, which is what I've been emphasizing uh, throughout this whole ser this, uh, service. Jesus would be lifted up on the cross to take the penalty of that broken covenant for us, as we've already seen, to pay for the guilt of those who would trust him. And for this sacrifice, the Father would draw all men to him. Now, as I've said, not every single person who has ever lived or whoever will live, but all kinds of men, Gentiles as well as Jews. And that's exactly what we see happening in this text. So what I want us to look at are basically two things. First of all, I want us to look at these Gentiles who wanted to see Jesus. I want, to know, I want us to see what's going on with them. And then secondly, I want us to look at Jesus, who though it may not appear so, wanted also to see these Gentiles. So first of all, let's consider these Gentiles. John writes in, in verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. So we'll just stop there for now. Now we should note, first of all, that the word that John uses for these men tells us that they were not ordinary Greeks, as you know, from uh, Greece, uh, they were not uh, just ordinary uh, Gentiles, but rather they were God-fearers. God-fearers, as you recall, are those who were still Gentiles, still Greeks. But there were certain things about them that drew them, I should say, to um, the Jewish religion. They believed in the God of the Jews. They believed that he was the only God, the true God. Uh, they had converted to their religion. But they were not circumcised. They somehow found circumcision to be objectionable and they would not be circumcised and as long as they weren't circumcised they would remain God-fearers and, and Gentiles and not Jews. Now John would have called them proselytes if they had been circumcised. But not being circumcised, they were basically in the same category as Cornelius. Remember Cornelius we read about in Acts chapter 10 and his household those that the Lord sent Peter to preach to. And that was the second group, remember, that the Lord in his mercy uh, built a bridge over to with the gospel when he began to send his gospel out to the world. He began to bridge these different cultural groups, these different, these different people groups. The first were the, the Samaritans. He sent Philip to the Samaritans. And they were half Jew, half Gentiles. But the second were to the god -fearers to Cornelius and people like that. Now the fact that they were God-fearers and not just a group of curious Gentiles who, who came up to Jerusalem at this time is further brought out by the reason they came to Jerusalem. Uh, John tells us what their purpose was. They came to the feast to worship. They came to glorify the God of Israel for his mercy to them, even though it isn't necessarily God's mercy to them in a certain sense because the Passover was commemorating God's mercy to the natural children of, of Israel and bringing them out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Pharaoh and so forth through all those plagues. It still had to do with them. It still was an act of his redemption and they wanted to worship him uh, for it. Now the interesting thing though I want you to note here is, is this. Uh, this is still before Jesus dies. This is still when the barriers are up. Uh, there are Jews and there are non-Jews. And even though these are God-fearers, they are still Gentiles like the rest. And as Gentiles, 
when they went up to worship to Jerusalem with the Jews, they could only go so far. They couldn't go as far as the Jews could go into the temple. Remember, the uh, temple was divided up into different compartments. There was what was called the inner court of the temple where the Jews came to worship. There, was, there were areas that were even more sacred where only the priests could go. And then there was the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go once a year. But there was that inner court that the Jews could come into and that they could worship. But then there was also the outer courts. That's called the court of the Gentiles. That's where these God-fearers could go, but they could go no further. That area is the same place that Jesus found those who were buying and selling in the temple. And remember, he drove them out. Uh, in some of the Gospels, we actually have Jesus going into the temple and driving them out in his last week, you see, in Jerusalem. John doesn't record that. He records the earlier cleansing, but not the later one. The other Gospel writers include the later one, but this is where it was taking place in the court of the Gentiles, and that's where these God-fearers could go. Now, it was considered a capital crime for a Gentile, even, even one who was a, a God-fearer, to enter into the inner court. A capital crime. If they went in there, they would be put to death. This is what they, the Jews accused Paul of, remember, later on in, in Acts chapter 21, when James tells him, you need to show the people that you still keep the tradition so here's four men under a vow take them into the temple pay their way and everyone will see that you're keeping the traditions well everybody thought the Jews thought Paul had taken Gentiles into the inner court of the temple and that he had committed a capital crime and that's why they wanted to kill him you know the Jews were so adamant about this separation between the outer and the inner court that the Romans actually allowed them to execute anyone who transgressed that boundary if a Gentile went in there they could put him to death. The law kept the Gentiles separated from the Jews. At this time, they were still separated, but Jesus came, as we're told in Galatians, to break down that wall that would separate Jews and Gentiles and to make them into one new man. Well, we see a glimpse of, of that that is what Jesus was, was coming to do in our text in these god fears now we should notice secondly about them that they were not only god fearers but they were god fearers who already knew something about jesus maybe they heard the testimony that jesus had raised lazarus from the dead maybe they heard or saw his entry into jerusalem and they understood something about what the jews were saying about him and so they wanted to meet jesus so they approached Philip. John writes in verse 21, These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now they may have come to Philip because of his name. You know, Philip is one of the disciples of Christ, but Philip is a Greek name. And I suppose if you have a choice between Philip, who has a Greek name, and Matthew, who has a Jewish name, you might, if you're a Greek, choose the guy who has the Greek name. Now it could also be because from where Philip was from. He was from Bethsaida of Galilee. John mentions that here. And it's significant because there were many Greeks who lived in that area, which is very likely why the, his parents, Philip's parents, actually gave Philip a Greek name. I think these Greeks thought Philip would be more sympathetic to their request. Now notice the way they approach Philip because they understand this wall of separation. They understand there's a distance between them. They understand, I think, maybe even something about why Jesus came into the world and what he was doing while he was there. They came in a very humble and respectful way and they said, Sir, calling Philip Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They knew they had no right to demand an audience with the Messiah Perhaps they weren't sure whether or not Jesus would even allow it because he was Israel's Messiah, not the Messiah of the Gentiles, though, of course, his work would have implications for them. And we'll be reminded in just a few moments that Jesus' ministry was primarily, was mainly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there were times when Jesus seemed even to turn Gentiles away. But still, they hoped that Jesus would see them. 
And then lastly, I want us to notice that they didn't merely want to look at Jesus. You know, hey, can we, can we see? We understand the Messiah's here. Can we see him? You know, can we gawk at him? You know, it's kind of like a, an interesting novelty. Here's the Messiah. I want to say when I go back to my family that I saw Jesus. You know, that's not what they're talking about here. They wanted to talk with Jesus. That's what the word means. They wanted to get to know him. They wanted to know for themselves whether this was really the Messiah. Now it appears from all these things, the fact that they're God-fearers who want to see the Lord Jesus Christ and want to get to know him, and also the, the way they approach Philip with, with this great respect and humility, that the Spirit was working in their hearts. Now we know from God's Word that there's two main ways that the Spirit of God works in the hearts of men. He can bring conviction of sin, you know, a concern about the punishment that God threatens for our sins to show us that we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we call that work usually awakening and it usually wakes us up to our need of Jesus and begins to move us in the right way and that's one way that somebody can approach the Lord Jesus. But sometimes the Spirit of God does more. Sometimes the Spirit of God creates in the soul a, a love for the Savior himself, a desire to get to know him a desire to trust him and to receive him, and at the same time, a desire to turn away from sin. Now, I think that's what we see happening here. The Spirit was basically drawing these God-fearers to Jesus Christ. He had already done so for, for many of the Jews, although it doesn't appear that way because there's only a handful of people that are really standing with Jesus when it comes time for his crucifixion and, and virtually the whole crowd gathering together calls out for his crucifixion. But there were those who were being saved as an indication of what the Father was going to do. You see, the Lord had already saved a lot of Jews, but now we see some Gentiles that are being drawn to Jesus. Not the only ones we've seen in the course of his ministry. But here's a group wanting to see Jesus, wanting to get to know him as an indication of what the Father was about to do on a much grander scale to honor His Son. Now let me just pause here for a moment for a bit of application. Okay, those of us who are here this morning who have turned from our sins and have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, we know something of what these men were experiencing. You know, when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, we came not just, just because we wanted to escape from hell, although we did want to escape from hell. You know, we were afraid of hell. We didn't want God's judgment. But we came for more reasons than just that. We came because we wanted to see him, like these Gentiles, like these God-fearers who wanted to see him. We wanted to get to know him. We wanted to learn more about what Jesus is really all about. We wanted to know what he thought was the difference between right and wrong so that we could do what was really honoring to the Lord and pleasing to him. We didn't do these things simply because we didn't want to go to hell. We turned to the Lord as well because we began to see sin for what it really is, dishonoring to God and harmful to our neighbors. Now this, again, is what the Spirit of God does in the hearts of everyone who knows Jesus Christ. He gives us love for what is good. That breaks the bondage of sin because that love for what is good also gives to us at the same time a hatred of what is evil. The Spirit of God breaks our bondage. He helps us to see. Now if you were to ask most of the people in this world, do you want to love what is good? Do you want to hate what is evil? They would probably, most of them, say yes, although there's some people who might challenge that. But they don't really understand what is good and what is evil. A lot of the people who are standing up for, for these, you know, um, homosexual marriages, uh, gender you know, sort of confusion type things, let a person, if a man wants to believe he's a woman, let him believe it. And if he wants to go into the girl's restroom, let him go in there. Don't discriminate. They think what they're doing is good. Okay? They think that's just showing consideration, care um, you know, for, for all men. Let's just let, let people do what they want to do and be what they want to be. 
But that's not what the Lord says is good and what the Lord says is evil. And a true believer actually wants to know what God says about it and doesn't just want to rely on the opinions of others or what they think is good or bad for an individual. The Bible actually says that those who practice homosexuality and those who are gender confused, if they continue in their sins and don't repent and turn to Jesus, that they're going to end up in hell. Not just because of that sin, but that sin's going to be part of it. It's not okay. It's dangerous for them to live that way. It's dangerous for our country to go that direction. That's why we have to stand against it. The Spirit of God has opened our eyes to see that, to know what is really good and what is really evil. And He is the one who causes us then, who makes us go in the right direction and respond to good and evil the way that we should, in a way that is honoring to God in the way that He says we should do it. So if the Lord has done that for you, you know what I'm talking about. Because you've already turned from your sins, you've trusted Jesus, and all these things I've just talked about that are true of these God-fearers are true of you. But if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus, if you haven't experienced these things, then may the Spirit of God open your eyes and show you that you need these things. May He graciously show you the danger that you're in. May he open your eyes to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and to how good his ways really are so that you might turn from your sins, trust him, and be saved. And by the way, may the Lord also open the eyes of all these homosexuals, all these that are gender confused, all of these who are involved in adultery, fornication, drunkenness, adultery, all of these sins. May he open their eyes and show them the truth so that they would see what they're doing is wrong and go the right direction, trust in Jesus and follow him. May the Spirit of God also, by the way, if, if you haven't trusted Jesus, may he also show you something we, we need to understand from what we've read. You know, Jesus said if he be lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men to himself, that Jesus stands with open arms, welcoming all who will come to him. And if you will come to Jesus, he will receive you. If you will come to Jesus, he will forgive you of everything that you have done. He will give you what you need to enter into heaven, a perfect obedience, a perfect righteousness. He will make you acceptable to the Father. That's what Jesus will do for you if you will trust him. And that is what we see next in our text. Second, I want us to consider that Jesus wanted to see them. You see, the Gentiles were not the only ones who wanted to see someone. They wanted to see Jesus. They were interested in Jesus. But Jesus was also interested in them. Now, it may not look like it on the surface, but you and I know that that is exactly what was on his heart when he talks about what he's talking about next. Now, first of all, we see the request was brought to Jesus. In verse 22, John continues, Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. Now, if you were Philip, you would probably do exactly what Philip did. You know, Philip probably went to Andrew because he didn't know what to make of this. So, Andrew, what do you think? Here's some God-fearers, here's some Gentiles that want to talk to Jesus. Now, Andrew, you know that Jesus said earlier that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he sent us out to preach to all the towns and villages around Israel, he specifically told us not to go in the way of the Gentiles or enter any of the cities of the Samaritans, but to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it's true that Jesus did make some exceptions. I mean, he did stop to talk to the woman at the well of Samaria, and he evangelized that old town. There was the centurion, you know, who came to him with the sixth servant, and Jesus basically praised him and said, you have the greatest faith of everyone I have seen in Israel. And the Syrophoenician woman who came and pleaded for her daughter, Jesus also had to do with her. But that wasn't the general course of his ministry. The general course is only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, Andrew, do you think Jesus <laughs> would want to talk to these God-fearers? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, neither of them seemed to, and so they came to Jesus, and they told him that that's what, what the situation was. And this is what we read then in verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, 
almost as if he's skirting the issue. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Well, what does that have to do with the question? Well, rather than telling them no and repeating what he had earlier, uh, the fact that, you know, the Father was beginning to draw others to him, particularly these Gentiles, was the indication to Jesus that the time of his glorification had come. Uh, Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The fact that there are these Gentiles seeking after me right now shows me that time has come. Now, I've already told you um, that we're going to see a little bit later in, in this same chapter uh, this statement of Jesus in verses 31 and 32. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus is looking at this request as the fulfillment of this, of this very passage, of what it is he came in the world to do, the way that his father was going to honor him. Now Jesus earlier said to the Samaritan woman, salvation is from the Jews. God made the promise to the Jews. The salvation that he would provide would come through the Jews. When it came, it would be preached first to them. Jesus said, I've come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but after they had had the opportunity either to accept it or to reject it, then the gospel would be preached to the Gentiles, to all the rest of the nations. Remember we, we mentioned just earlier, Philip went and preached to the Samaritans. Uh, Peter went to the God-fearing Gentiles, to Cornelius and his household. Paul went to the Gentiles. Jesus was looking at this request as the beginning of his father's work to glorify him by drawing all men to him. But before that could happen, something else had to take place. Jesus had to die. He had to be lifted up. So he says in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus was referring to himself. I think especially those who are, are farmers and those that have to continually plant their crops understand that if you leave the seed in the sack and you don't plant it, the seeds just remain as they are unless a little bit of moisture gets to them and so forth. But they don't multiply. But if it's planted and germinates and grows, it produces much more fruit, many more seeds. Jesus said the same thing was true of him. If he held on to his life, if he didn't go to the cross, if he didn't lay his life down, he would remain alone. But if he laid his life down, if he willingly gave himself up on the cross, he would save many lives, not just from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles, from all the nations, from the entire world. Now again, I ask the question, was Jesus really interested in these Gentiles who wanted to see him? Did he really want to see them? Well, he did want to see them because they appeared to be some of those that Jesus spoke about earlier in John chapter 10. Remember, he was talking about the good shepherd and he lays down his life for the sheep and he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, not of Israel. And I'm going to bring them too and they're going to become one flock with one shepherd. Well, here were some of those sheep, you see, already, yes. Jesus was interested in them. He was interested in seeing them. But he was saying, basically, not just yet. Because first he says, I have to go to the cross. First I have to be lifted up. First I have to die. I have to be buried. I have to be raised again from the dead. I have to ascend into heaven. And there, that's where I will see them when they would come and join me there later. Because Jesus loves Gentiles just as much as he loves Jews. He loves all who trust in him. He's made them into one new man. That barrier that separated them is no longer there because Jesus destroyed it. He abolished it on the cross. So all now are welcome to come to him and all will be treated equally. There is no longer Jew and Gentile in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, basically, the same thing is true for us, isn't it? Because like those God-fearing Gentiles who trusted in Jesus, we are also a part of the same sheepfold. Like those Gentiles, we were born Gentiles. All of us here, I think, were born Gentiles. We were not Abraham's natural seed. We were not his, his children. We were not natural Jews. But through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have become the spiritual children of Abraham. Jesus is also interested in seeing us. I don't think we've ever actually questioned that. We know that he will. We know that through the gospel because that's what the Bible tells us. But one day we actually are going to see him. You know, we, we should have the same attitude, I think, that these God-fearing Gentiles have. We want to see Jesus. We want to know him. We want to get to know him. We want to walk with him. We want to follow him. And literally, yes, we do want to see him. One day we will actually get to see him if we have trusted him. But it won't be until we see him in glory, unless, of course, he happens to come before we die, which I, I think is a remote possibility. Now, for those of you, again, who haven't yet trusted Jesus, I want you to understand that he is interested in you as well. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to turn from your sins and follow him. He promises you that if you will do that, if you will trust him, he will receive you. You will not be disappointed. That's one thing I think we're going to look at this evening. Uh, the Lord doesn't tell you, leave behind all the fun and choose a life of misery. And it's going to be miserable for the rest of your life. At least you won't go to hell. You won't be as miserable as you would otherwise if you decide to hang into the, onto this world and have fun. Jesus promises you something far greater than anything you will get out of this world. You will not be disappointed if you leave your sin, if you leave the world, if you leave your old life behind you in order to follow him. Jesus says he will bless you. Jesus says he will help you through this life. I mean, this life is tough. It's hard to live. Jesus says he will help you to live it and to live it for his glory. And he will bring you one day to be with him in heaven. And when you get there, he will be happy to see you. And he will receive you. And he will allow you to get to know him even better than you might get to know him here. That's true of all of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus. But there is something you have to do. You have to come to him. You have to turn from your sins and trust in him. If you're willing to do that, he will receive you. Are you willing this morning to do that? Well, may the Lord grant to you that you would be willing to leave it all behind. You cannot hang on to the world and have Jesus too. You have to let go of one or the other. And actually, you can never really take hold of Jesus unless you let go of the world. We're going to make some distinctions this evening to understand you know, exactly what that means again. doesn't mean you can't have recreation. doesn't mean you can't enjoy the things of the world. But you cannot have any idols. You cannot love anything more than him. You cannot hold on to the sinful things of this world. You have to let go of all that to trust Jesus. And if you do, you will not be disappointed because if you do, Jesus died for you. He loves you. And he is going to watch over you he is going to bring you to heaven and he is going to bless you throughout all eternity with the only kind of blessing that, that, that exists in creation, in the world, that never grows old. Everything in this life you get tired of. That's why we keep going from one thing to another to another. There's no song you can listen to that will give you uninterrupted pleasure from now to the end of your life. There's, there's nothing you can do, enjoy. Everything grows old. Everything grows tiring because it's limited but here is one blessing that is unlimited and you'll never get tired of it. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself in heaven. So may the Lord grant that we all would trust him and would all have that hope that one day we're going to be uh, with him. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to help us do that, to trust him.